Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is Mae Cryer. She is one of the very first Rosie the Riveters. Those, of course, are the women who went to the factories in World War II after the men went off to war. Those women then produced the arsenal of democracy that were used to win wars in Europe and the Pacific. More recently, she has worked hard to have the government commemorate a special day each year in honor of all the Rosies who helped save the world from tyranny. And May, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Where were you born and raised? I was born in North Dakota, and that was during the Great Depression. Calvin Coolidge was president when I was born, and was uh, also the Dust Bowl. It was hard times, very difficult times, but the Great Depression was all over the country. It wasn't just our area. And uh, like I said, it was hard times. Now, good times didn't start up until the 1930s when Roosevelt started putting in good programs, and you know, programs like that really helped us come out of the Depression. So North Dakota, I'm guessing your dad was a farmer? No, my father worked for grain elevators. Okay. At one time he was a farmer, but that was when I was maybe real, real small. Okay. Uh, we lived in a small town, and he was in charge of a grain elevator. And uh, that, that was a good job at the time. Before that, they were, uh, Roosevelt had put in the programs like the WPA, which he worked on before the, he was able to do work in the elevator, and the CCCs, which uh, put young, young men in the camps. You know, they went and uh, cleaned roads or built bridges, and it helped the families, the big families that couldn't afford to feed so many. It was a good program because it also fed them and it helped our country, which was, uh, was good, real, real nice. You, you mentioned it was a tough life uh, in the Depression and the Dust Bowl. Describe that a little bit. What was your life like day to day? Well, we had nothing, but nobody did. And I said, when uh, uh, people were very, it was a time when people looked out for each other. If a family was down and out, didn't have enough to eat, or had, was, didn't have a place to live, another family would take them in. And it was just our way of life. Nobody went without, because if somebody had something, they shared it. And it, like I said, it was hard times. During the Great Depression, we lived in a small town where we were halfway between a couple of larger cities. And of course, at that time, there was, the trains were run by water and coal, and we were a stopping point. So when these trains would stop, though they called them hobos or bums, but they really weren't. They were men trying to find a decent job. They'd just travel on these, and they could come off the, the train, and they'd come to the doorsteps. I remember many times when they'd knock on the door and mother would make them an egg sandwich. We always had eggs or chickens. Mother would make them an egg sandwich, and they were very appreciative. And then they'd go on to find a place where they could uh, get a job. And that was our way of life during the Great Depression, not just in the Middle West, but all over our country. They were much better off in the West or the East because there was industry, you know, that was much uh, more, was helpful. Right. Yes. How many were in your family? Uh, I had five, one, one of, in my mother's family. There was five of us, one died at birth. And, uh, but my brother was the oldest. Of course, he had went off to war, but then I had a, a sister about my age. We were very close together, who I loved dearly. And another sister came along quite a few years later. She's the only one that's still alive. Okay. Uh, that was our life. We had a good family. Where were you on December 7th, 1941? Oh, I remember that day so well, I'll never forget it. My sister and I, it was a Sunday, and my sister and I had been to a matinee. When we came home, our folks were sitting around the radio very upset. And we said, well, what had happened? And I said, well, Japan had bombed Pearl Harbor. And I stopped for a moment and I said, you know, I don't know whether I really know where Pearl Harbor is. You know, we didn't have uh, instant news or we didn't, we weren't sophisticated about the rest of the world at that time. So, but we found out in a hurry where Pearl Harbor was. Mm. You know, that was a day that it'll remain forever in our hearts because look at what it did, change the whole world. Of course. Uh -huh. And how old was your brother at that time? Did he? Uh, my brother was in his 20s. I'm not just sure because the minute the war was declared, he enlisted. Uh, I'm not too sure. I would imagine maybe 21, 22 at the time. And, and what were you thinking? Not too much. I was a teenager having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> what did happen, though, is when these, uh, all of our boys enlisted immediately, as soon as the war was declared, they all went and enlisted. And of course, when the boys left, the girls wanted to go, too. They, they left. We started, bit by bit, we started going west to the, you know, we went like, like I worked at Boeing. Uh, my sister and I and our girlfriend thought, well, let's go out west for the summer. That ought to be fun. And that's what we did, but we loved it, and we stayed. 
and we all became Rosie the Riveters at Boeing in Seattle. How did you learn about the need for women in the factories? I, I don't really whether really, really we knew. It was early in the war, see, and uh, we just knew that it was a good job, and people, they didn't recruit us, although I, I read one story, I don't know who wrote it, but he said, Rosie the Riveter was the most successful recruitment tool in American history. Now, a lot of them were re recruited, I think. I'm not sure. We weren't. We just went on our own. We thought we'd go to Seattle and have a ball for the summer, but <laughs> the way it turned out, we, we, we loved it, and we stayed. Training was pretty short before they put you to work, right? Just a yeah. couple Oh, weeks. yeah, two weeks. We had two weeks training. they take us downtown Seattle, and they'd uh, hook up like they put it in a vice, a sheet of metal, and we had to learn how to drill holes, and then we had to learn how to... Uh, Rivet, and we had to, well, first as a buckler, you had to learn to buck, and then you, had, you became a riveter after that. But that was it, and right after that two weeks, then we go working with these big airplanes, big bombers. Did it come pretty naturally to you? Did you feel you were it ready did, to do yes. it? Yes. It was much easier for me than it was my sister because I was tomboy. And uh, when we had to climb in and out of those wings, I don't know whether you're familiar with the B-20s, uh, the 17s we worked on first. There's ribs in all those wings, and we used to have to crawl, weave in and out of those ribs to do the riveting and the, or bucking on the inside. You had to be pretty flexible and <laughs> not claustrophobic or you wouldn't be in the air. But that was quite an experience because you had the riveter on the outside and we were on the inside and we had our own uh, system. We had to, we used the bucking bars for our message and tap so many times to remove the rivet or so many times to hit it again. Or if you had to move, you had a message where you had to bar, get a bar behind the rib. You had, that was a different role we had to play. So we had to learn all that. And after a while, you, it's like a rhythm. You pick, if you get a good riveter, it's not bad at all because you just pick up a, a method of, or in a rhythm like. So you kind yeah. of created your own language. What I did right, yeah, that's what it amounted to. It, it's, it's, it felt like that. A well-oiled machine. How many, yeah. how many women would be working on a, a, a bomber at a time? I have no clue because the, I worked in just the wing section of the cell. That's where the engine goes. They would set up jigs. There would be like maybe, the, I can't say whether there's four or six jigs with uh, maybe four or five uh, wings in each one. So we just go from one wing to the other. But we more or less stayed in our own jig or our own, it's a platform which, you know, where the, the, the wings are lined up. Uh, they, where they, you know, they didn't lay flat, they were, they're lined up, so, uh, you know, up straight. So that's how we wove in and out of them. You mentioned being flexible uh, uh, helped uh, with the job. Uh, what else? Uh, did you have some strength from, uh, from, from being young that helped you? Well, sure. Look at those muscles. <laughs> 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 no, it, it helped. But it was amazing because, you know, the women came in in droves, and some of the women say, oh, I can't do that. But before they got done with them, they trained them and all. Some of them turned out better than the others. I thought they could do it. So it's just a matter of uh, perseverance, I guess. And of course, we were there to win the war. That was our purpose. Mm -hmm. so that made a big difference. From from day to day, was your focus on? It was probably both. But was it winning the war, or this is a good job at a difficult time? I think at the time it started out it was a good job, but as the time went on, we got very patriotic. It uh, we it was never my job or your job. It was our job. We had one purpose, and that, and that was to win the war, to make the equipment that our men needed to win the war. And that was our purpose. I, I'm, stories I love to tell is about we worked with Gold Star Mothers. They're the mothers who have lost a son or widows that have lost their husband. And they didn't quit working because they lost their son or their husband. The Gold Star Mother said, I don't want another mother to lose a son because he doesn't have the equipment he needs. And I thought that that's a strong woman, outstanding woman. And of course, we gathered around them and in our sympathy went with them because that was a a really bad time for them, but they hung right in there and did what our country needed. They were amazing women. I'm proud of them. I'm proud to be one of the millions that did it, you know. I'm still proud. You can see that I, how hard I've worked for 75 years to get our rosy day. Yes. So We'll be talking about that a lot in, in a little bit. Uh -huh. How common was that for a co-worker to get news that their loved one had been killed? Not, not often. Okay. I don't remember maybe one case of a mother of, of, of a gold star mother. I knew of more of wives that lost their husbands. But, you know, you'd, you're working with so many thousands of people, you don't hear all the stories. But the ones that are close to you, like are working on the same platform, those are the ones you get to know. So I do know, you know, like I said, I knew one in particular who had lost her son. And, and 
and right now, or at least or right now, I've just met another another gold star mother that I traveled with, around with to like to honor tables and what have you. I feel so sorry for him. Um, one of the thing you worked on B-17s and B-29s. Right. Which one did you prefer? 17. Why? We, it was so much easier. They were lumen rivets. They were, they were smaller rivets, especially on the wing where it was a, you know, it was fast moving, and it was you were working right there with everything, and they, they were like a, we had a smaller rivet gun for one thing, and women they seemed to be more agile or flexible than a man, so we could sometimes we were better than the men at that. Depend on what, you know, what part of the plane your wing you were working on, uh, as to whether you know your ability. But as a general rule, women were every bit as good, sometimes better than the men. Not that we were competing, we weren't competing, but, but that's just the way it was, you know? What do you think the balance was? Because obviously some men were, couldn't serve in the military and so forth, or they, maybe they were older. Right, right. Um, so what was, the, what was the balance between men and women where you were? Uh, there's many more women. I just don't know, I don't rem recall the balance, but I know that I worked with a man from Iowa, I never forgot it. He, I, he was played tricks on me, but he was really nice. He respected me. He made me a much better riveter than I would ever d done without him. So uh, these are the things you know that you remember well, because like I said, he was not necessarily training. I worked with him at different times. I would be the bucker as for him, even though I was a riveter for a difficult or a special place. And when we had special places, sometimes ask a bucker to go along with another riveter which I did with him quite often. It was kind of an interesting story, but he was great, but he used to play tricks on me. He'd send me to a tool crib for something stupid, you know, and they'd laugh, they'd get a big kick out of it. But, you know, it was humor. He didn't mean anything by it. Uh -huh. So I, I, to this day, I have no clue where he was. He's probably not alive anymore, but I think we can talk about him all the time. May, this is a fantastic story. We're gonna take a quick break. Uh -huh. We'll be right back to continue your story. We're with May Cryer on Veterans Chronicles. We are back on Veterans Chronicles. May Cryer is my guest. She was one of the original Rosie the Riveters and was a driving force behind a national day to commemorate uh, the Rosie the Riveters. And that effort has met with success, as we'll talk about a little bit later. Right now we're talking about the work that she did during World War II, uh, building specifically B-17s and, and B-29s. When we left off, we were talking about some of the tricks that one of your coworkers <laughs> w uh, had a tendency to play on you. Uh, one of the things uh, that also, of course, had to happen after you did the work was to have the planes inspected. What was that like? Oh, that, it was, I don't know of any women inspectors. They were mostly all men inspectors. Now, if they didn't like you, like, uh, you know, the men got fresh with the women at that time. And if they didn't like you, well, they could tell you to take that rivet out or, you know, make you do your job over again. And this one inspector kept after this one woman, and she, uh, he would spit. He, you weren't allowed to smoke, but you could chew tobacco. And he spit near her equipment. And one day he spit on her equipment, and she just refused to work till he cleaned it up. Well, the assembly line just stopped. We thought, well, she's going to get fired. It was so funny. They came along, and they made him clean it up. He never spit on anybody's equipment after that. Wow. But you see, that, that was the difference between men and women at the time. Men resented it, women being in there. Some of them, I never ran into that. I was fortunate not that. But some of the men resented the women being there. So don't forget, you know, up until 1941, it was a man's world, mm -hmm. and uh, they didn't know that how capable American women were, and they were more, they were amazing. I'll tell you, the story I always like to tell is Hitler said that he wouldn't have any trouble defeating America because American women couldn't produce. He said we were soft and spoiled. And he said, you know, we spent too much money on cosmetics and stockings, frivolous things. And I think we showed Hitler what American <laughs> women were made of. <laughs> I thought that was very interesting. You sure yeah. did. He calculated wrong uh -huh. on that for sure. <laughs> you also had the opportunity to meet uh, General Hap Arnold. Yes, uh, that was so nice because Hap Arnold was a five-star general and for the Army Air now because there was no Air Force. He would come into the plant now. And he'd walk among us and shake our hands and talk to us and when he leaves the, the plant we just all be so proud of what we were doing he just had that effect on us and I I really admire him and I've got pictures of him in my house where he's on Time magazine uh, now I know he's buried in Arlington I'd love to go there and see because he left a mark on me and I thought it was great and he was so great with the wasps are you familiar with the women flyers yep. well when they started out there was only like a, I think like a 
uh, 1,023 or something like that. Now these were trained pilots. They were already pilots before they became wasps. He said he can't imagine these petite, petite young women flying these huge bombers. But after a while, he said they were every bit as good as the men. He said only only problem they had with that is the parachutes were made for men, and these petite they were way too big for these petite young pilots. <laughs> I thought that was good, but he really admired the the wasp and their and their uh, ability to fly those bombers, and they were the ones that ferried our planes. We would you know we take them to the tarmac, and that was the end. We never seen them again, and somebody had to move them, and they moved them fast. So. That was the story of the uh, General Hap Barnard. So he really respected the work that you oh, did. Oh, yeah. And you know, he became, of course, when, we get res uh, when the Air Force was doing, he became a five-star general in the Air Force. So now he had two, two careers where he was a five-star general with the Army Air and the Air Force. I thought that was amazing. Yeah, there aren't too many like him. That's kind of a record, you That's know. It's got to be unique, I uh -huh. would think. Um, you were also part of a milestone in producing B-17s, the 5,000th Oh, yes. B I love that because... This was in 1944. This, we, now we'd built 5,000 B-17s since Pearl Harbor. And when we, for celebration, they let us all paint our names on it. And oh, we had so much fun doing it. And uh, I mean, we were working along with it. It wasn't that we put in any work aside. But it was such an exciting time for us because it was like a, christening a battleship. Because when, when we got down and it was all put together and we, and we moved it out on the tarmac, we all got to push it. We, we worked on moving it. I said, if Osha would have seen us, they'd have had a fit. <laughs> <laughs> but this was such an exciting time in our lives. And I, no, I stayed in touch with the historian in Boeing, and he told me stories of what happened to it after it left our plant. He said it made 78 missions over Europe, and it only had one injury. It came back with just one injury. Did a fine job, and when it returned home, they used it for, you know, they sold war bonds, yet they still uh, sell war bonds. They used it on tours to sell war bonds, and they tried to keep it as a museum piece, but it didn't get enough votes. And so he sent me pictures of it. Here it is, uh, strapped in Kingsman Air Force Base in Mesa, Arizona. Our names are still on it. And I said I wish if I'd had any sense, I'd have gone to Mesa, Arizona just to <laughs> see it or maybe get a piece of it. But uh, he sent me that picture, and I treasure that. So it's still there. Yeah. Well, I imagine it's probably scrapped now. You oh, know. Okay. Who, I don't know what they do. There's, if you ever see those airfields after a war, they're just loaded with planes, and you know. What a great story. Yeah. What a great story. So, um, you were in Seattle uh, throughout the, the the bulk of the war. Right. Um, what was it like being in Seattle? Oh, I love Seattle. In fact, I just went back uh, last year. Uh, uh, the women, Washington women in trade, they do a, a story called uh, "Watching Women Soar." The legacy of Rosie the Riveter, and they called me and they told me I'm the month of March on their calendar, and would I like to come for the release of the calendar in November? Of course, I jumped on the first plane, <laughs> <laughs> and we had so much fun, and it's such a nice honor to, you know, to have it continue like this and still honor Rosie. That's nice. Absolutely, uh -huh. and you're a calendar girl. That's. Oh, uh, <laughs> I laughed. I said we were on the plane. They were making a big deal of it. And I said, well, I'm not the centerfold anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love your attitude. Let's take another quick break. We'll be right back with May Cryer, and we'll learn all about the effort to create a national day to commemorate all the women who went to the factories. We'll be right back on Veterans Chronicles. Welcome back to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Columbus. Honored to be joined today by May Cryer, one of the very original Rosie the Riveters, a fascinating story of her time. Uh, it's really in service to our country as she worked to assemble B-17s and, and B-29 bombers. And uh, May, we talked a lot about the B-17s, which you preferred to work on. Uh, what about the B-29s? How are they different to assemble? Well, with the B-17s, we, we pr uh, produced them much faster. We, I think we, we built 6,000 in our plant alone in at Boeing. Altogether, it was 12,000. But with the B-29s, now it's getting closer to the end of the war. So I think we only produced 4,000 B-29s. They were having little problems with, I think it was fire in the engines or something. There was, I know it was a problem. They had to, to slow it down. But uh, the B-29 now, it was like a, I don't, know how to describe it. it was a gray material I don't know it like an um, al alloy or something I'm not sure but now these are all countersunk rivets now we had to go with the flat head a countersunk uh, sink head and the rivets were cold now we had to take these rivets out of the freezer and we could only keep them out a little while because once they got warm they would crack when they were when we rivet them of course if we cracked a rivet and they had to take it out again it just made a larger hole and they frowned on that because it tended to weaken the wing 
Mm. Which the wing is what I worked on all the time. That and there's a cell where the engine went. So that's my, my experience with the B-29. Uh, I don't know why, whether it was just because the war was nearly over, but I have a love for a B-17 I can't explain. <laughs> In fact, the lady that did my story, she called it my love affair with my B-17. <laughs> <laughs> but you have certain things that is, uh, remain with you forever. Sure, yeah. absolutely. Uh -huh. Do you know if the B-29, that, that, that uh, the Enola Gay, do you know if you made that one? I, I asked the uh, historian that, because I, I used to write to him. and I asked him, he said it was possible. And I said, oh, wow, I put a rivet in the Nola Gate. But then I heard later that it was made in Wichita. Oh, so I don't know, but I think that must be true. But there went my fame, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that I thought I had, I could have had, is nice. Right, you know? yeah, uh -huh. absolutely. And you definitely worked on many that did a lot of, oh, yeah. a lot right. to help uh -huh. win the war. So right. um, in 1944, uh, in addition to uh, the war going on and your work going on, you also fell in love, correct? Yes, sir. Well, not at the moment. I <laughs> met him on the dance floor. Boy, could he dance. He was a jitterbug, and, well, he could do everything, but we just become good friends, and that, that was 1944, and by 1945, we were starting to get a little serious, but all of a sudden, he was shipped out, and then we realized that we liked each other more, and we thought we did, <laughs> and he used to write to me all the time. I still have all of his letters. They were beautiful letters, and I still have the pack of letters that Miles have gotten into him, but... And uh, like I said, Denny, we decided to get married. He was transferred to a naval air station in Pasco, Washington, and that's where I went to work with the. Um, I went to work for the uh, uh, federal government uh, engineers, Army engineers, and that's where I started working with Italian prisoners of war. And I worked there now until the war was over, uh, which was I forget what that was. It wasn't long. I mean, before the war was over, after that, I don't know what the prisoners. I've often wondered. When and where did they send the prisoners home? Because, you know, we were, when the war was over, you went by points for the men to be discharged. And Norm, my husband, had a lot of points, so he was one of the first ones to go home. And, of course, when we got home, they didn't have these stations set up yet for discharge. There were so many coming home all at once. So I remember he went to well, uh, Wildwood, New Jersey, then Bainbridge, Maryland. I think that was where he was discharged from. Okay. And now we come back to reality of going back to work and, you know. <laughs> Where did he serve in the Navy? He was in the Aleutians for about 10 months. You didn't know, people don't realize that the Japanese were building um, airfields up in the Aleutians. They planned on coming down that way. So they went in. He was lucky that he was with an aircraft tender, so he didn't actually have to go in on land. But he tells me as a rough seas. Oh, he, he didn't talk a lot about it. He was a quiet man. But he'd tell about the rough seas up there, and I guess it's the Barren Sea around that area. Mm -hmm. He told how they didn't have to hold their food like this because otherwise it would be all over the, the I guess, and he would never go on a cruise because he said, if you've been on one of those ships that many times, that long, you don't want to go on a cruise. <laughs> He's had enough. Uh, but he came back, he was stationed in Bremerton for a while and then the Naval Air Station in Seattle. Okay. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about your work with the Italian prisoners. I found that very interesting. You know, people, it's, a lot of them couldn't speak English, but they tried. There were a lot of them that would inter interpret for each other. But when, they were nice. I think they paid them 80 cents a day. I'm not just sure because, you know, for toiletries and, and uh, you know, shaving lotion, cigarettes, what have you. But they would come in and they'd help us work, and they, would, uh, they were no different than we were. All I could think about is, you know, they're prisoners of war, but they just want to get home to their families just like we do. We want this war over and, you know, settle down. But a lot of them, were, now they were allowed to go out. If, if a, a family would invite them to come out for dinner, they were allowed to go out. And some of them end up marrying and staying here. Really? Yeah. I wish I knew more about what happened to them afterwards. But at the time, our life was just, let's get this over with and go back to normal, you know? So, uh, but that, that was an interesting time. I'm, I've looked all over for Rosie to find anybody that had worked with Italian. There was other, other prisoners of war, two Germans and what have you, but. It just happened to be we knew the most about the Italians. You know. Right, right. Uh, That's so interesting. It is. It, I found it very interesting. I always remember some things you forget. Uh, but it, and it was so funny when, we, when I hired in at the Army Engineers, I still have my paperwork. Boeing, I forget, I was 90 some cents there when we started. I was 83 cents an hour when I hired in. Isn't that big, big bucks? <laughs> 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 I'm glad I kept that part of it. Now I worked at, at uh, Kaiser's in Bristol, Pennsylvania. Uh, during the Korean War, uh, it was a rosy, I read it for a while, but now all we're working on is this little tail. I'm used to huge ships, you know, 
but it it didn't, it wasn't the same. It wasn't. The, I was working there because we needed the money. Mm -hmm. The war was over. Now all these companies were retooling. They were going back to making refrigerators and radios and what have you. So uh, they so many strikes. It was unbelievable, and that was very hard times. It was a harder time after the war sometimes. Really? So my husband had worked for Westinghouse before the war, so we had a job to come back to. We were fortunate that most of the Rosies, especially those who lost their husbands, Boeing gave them a day to give them their receipt, their pay stub, and they had a next day they would collect their money. And that was it. I often said that the the men came home to parades and flying flags, and Ruby and Rosie came home with a pink slip, and that's just about what it amounted to. It didn't affect me, but it affected many. So. I felt sorry for those. Well, that's a good lead into how this effort got started to commemorate all mm -hmm. the Rosies. Um, how did you begin the process of trying to? Well, like I told you, I, my, my son started with saying, I didn't know you worked with prisoners of war. And then, of course, my daughter uh, I started asking questions, too. Now, they were raised. And I thought, I kept thinking about it. You know, the men came home to parades and flying flags. And R Rosie came home with a pink slip. It just didn't seem fair because we did as much to win the war. Well, we weren't in the trenches or anything like that, but we did everything possible. Everything that been needed, we made. I mean, the women didn't. They made chips, tanks, jeeps, uh, uh, airplanes, ammunition. Some worked in very dangerous ammunition factories, parachutes. So it wasn't anything that the women didn't make that the men needed. So it, I just thought it wasn't fair that Rosie didn't have some recognition for what she did for the war. And like the mu museum here, down here, the World War II Museum, I was here with the veterans. Of Honor Flight had taken me with them a year or so ago. I couldn't find anything with, about Rosie the Riveter. So yesterday, we were over there in the park guard. When he heard I was a Rosie the Riveter, he just took me all over. He made me feel like I was a queen. <laughs> and he showed me there's a small plaque there. We've got to put a statue in there. I mean, it's not fair to Rosie that she didn't get her share, fair share of recognition. And we're not asking for anything except just to give us our day of recognition. We've earned it, you know? Think as simple as that. So how did you build on this effort and push this idea forward? Well, I started writing. I'm a letter writer. I would write to newspapers. I'd write to television stations. I even wrote to the Veterans Organization here in Washington. And they'd respond to me. They'd say, thank you for your service, nice letter, and that was it. But I didn't give up. And in 1990, I, I got even more determined. But it wasn't until about 2000 that all of a sudden, one of the papers picked up on my stories. And ever since then, it's just snowballed. Uh, West Point has picked up on me. They've invited me so many places. The Marine Corps and the Philadelphia Police have invited me. The Honor Flights invite me. And I just can't begin to tell you how many. Well, here I'm with Warren and them, they're with their, uh, their group. Now, this is, I mean, I've met them before, but this is the first that I've traveled with them because I'm with other groups, too. And we do a lot for charity, which is nice, real nice. So it's just been fun. It's really been a good time. I'm just so thankful that I'm well enough to be able to do this, you know, because many of our Rosies aren't. They want to do it, but they just don't, there's just nothing left. I mean, they have bad legs or, you know, it's, it's just sad. No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's fantastic. You're in fantastic shape. Oh. <laughs> and uh, so what pushed it over the goal line for you? Well, it's funny because when the, the first newspaper story came out, it was a really nice story. I've had so many now since then, but the Tw uh, Twilight Wish Foundation, that's an organization that grants wishes to seniors. They read my story and they called the paper and they said for her uh, duty to her country, we want to send her to her national um, uh, convention in California. And they did and they paid everything. Well, I've, they've hooked up, we've just hooked up together and we've just had the best time. It was through them and the West Point group that we got to Washington for our national day. And uh, it's just amazing what people know. It's just another group has picked up on me, wants me to promote the charity, just charity things like the women's soccer team. They want me to help raise some money for them. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's wonderful where it doesn't take much for me to do it, but it helps them a lot. And I think that's good. You know, that's nice. So is this something Congress had to approve eventually? Yes, yes. Our Congress, we had my, um, first of all, Mike Fitzpatrick, that he's our congressman from our district in, uh, in Bucks County. He proposed it in, um, in 2015, just in my name. I was so I was so surprised. I was stunned because he's here. He's in Washington on the floor saying, "May Cryer this and May Cryer that." I said, "Wow, that was such an honor." But we didn't realize that California is also proposing one, and uh, so we got together, 
and now the, two, the lady that's working on it out in California, her two senators and representatives and my two got together and they proposed it and it passed, it passed unanimously. I think they had 68 votes. We're so proud of that because it took a long time getting there. Why did you pick March 21st? Well, it's so funny because when they first asked me, Brian Fitzpatrick, our congressman, asked me what day, I said, I really don't know because um, I, uh, Governor Christie from New Jersey had made, asked me, and I said, well, I think Norman Rockwell's uh, poster came out on that day. I think that's why. I said, I don't, I don't really know. I don't have a particular date to pick. But the people in California wanted March 21st. Uh, that's Women's History Month, but why the 21st? That fell on my 91st birthday, and what a time <laughs> I had in Washington. <laughs> and they brought, my congressman brought me a cupcake plus a, a copy of our resolution. They were all singing happy birthday. I don't know how many times they sang happy birthday to me during the day. Uh, but it was just, it was, it was very exciting, I'll tell you. If you live long enough, it, you, you reap the rewards. <laughs> <laughs> so what does it mean to you after this long effort, and of course the work that you did as a riveter, what does it mean to you that this day exists now? Well, I'm so proud. I'm really proud. And it took a lot of doing because I'm, I'm a letter writer. I don't let up. I mean, like I told Senator Casey, I said, I think you gave me this day because you're getting tired of hearing from me. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a nice, he's, he's our senator too. And he's a good one. He fights for what is, what's right and not what whatever somebody wants. He fights for what's right. I like that. But uh, no, I just, uh, it's just a matter of not giving up. You know, just keep at it. I thought, it isn't fair. I mean, the women, you had to see that time in our lives. The, the women were amazing. They were really amazing. I mean, it, it, like I said, it wasn't my job or your job. It was our job, and we were just there to win the war. It was simple as that, you know? As far as my, uh, Going after the Rosie thing, it was a blessing when the papers picked up on it because now my state representative, they're taking me to meet the governor and all kinds of things. They've done, they've done uh, uh, laws like equal pay for, for women, you know, for the, uh, doing the same job as a man. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is really, it's rewarding because it's bringing about not just fun for me and, and, and things for, that's bringing about for Rosie Riveter, it's also doing some good. One of the groups that just picked up on me, in fact, I've met her before, but she does. A, she has a charity job, and she, and she does a lot of work in Ethiopia. They build water water wells over there, and she says to me, May, she wants me to go along with her and promote. The, well, one of the things is the women's soccer team because they don't get what the men get in our national soccer team. And uh, she said, my son said she's kidding me about going to Ethiopia with her. My son said, uh uh. <laughs> 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 oh, and another group picked up on me called Plain and Sa Plain and Fancy. They're from West Virginia. And she's invited me to go to Netherlands with them. So uh -huh. I said, it's kind of nice, you know. I, it, it's a nice thing. I just hope I stay well enough. You know, I've been very fortunate. I get up every morning and count my blessings. I said, you just have to be awful lucky to have good health and, and vitality, you know. It all goes together. You're becoming a celebrity. <laughs> I don't know about that, but I'm having fun doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, where was all of this publicity when I was a teenager needed it? <laughs> <laughs> We've just got about a minute left in our conversation. And obviously, the, the, with the day now in place and the attention that the Rosie the Riveters are getting is increasing, uh, more and more people will either remember it or, or learn about it, which is obviously very important. When they do study it, now and in the future, what do you want them to remember and learn most about you and the other Rosies? Mostly what women are capable of. They, you know, like I told you before, it was a man's world. They didn't realize how capable women are. Women have got so many qualities. If they just get out and use them, so many of them stand back because they think, well, he's a man, he can do it better. It's not the case at all. I mean, you've, I tell these young people when I speak to them at school, don't think you can't do it. Try it. I mean, follow your dreams. I mean, just because it's not a man's world anymore. If it's something you want, go for it. And of course, I used Hillary. I loved Hillary. And I'm sorry that this came about, but I used Hillary as an example. I said, that's why you got a woman running for president. And of course, the girls, oh, they loved that. <laughs> <laughs> and the Democratic Party picked up on me. They took me all over. They introduced me to Bill Clinton. I got to kiss Joe Biden. And it's just, you know, things like that. Things that I'd never got if I'd have sat home in my rocking chair, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have the uh, stereotypical Rosie 
bandana and the shirt and all that yeah, stuff? Yeah, I think Brian, uh, one of the guys have it. I had. I hate bandana. Oh, I shouldn't say hate. I don't like that word. But uh, I, it was with me today. But I th it's out there with with what they're carrying that I okay. left behind. But no, they like me to wear it. But I, I don't like bandanas. <laughs> <laughs> you wore it enough back in the 1940s uh, yeah, and 50s. Yeah, yeah, we right? had to wear them then because you know the reason for the bandana was. If a drill got caught in your hair, it would just pull a gob of hair right out. Mm -hmm. So that's kept you from getting, you know, but especially if the, if the bucker, the riveter on the outside was going to drill a hole, you don't know where that hole's coming through if you're in the wing. And so you, you better have your bandana on or something because you could just pull a gob right out. So that was the main reason for the bandanas. Very know. interesting. Uh -huh. May, it has been a pleasure to speak with you today. Well, thank you pleasure. so much for what you did for our country and have done for our country. And thank you for your time today. And I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. May Cryer, one of the original Rosie the Riveters and one of the leading forces behind a national day to commemorate the women who served as Rosies, officially observed every year now on March 21st. I'm Greg Corumbus. This is Veterans Chronicles.